joy to the world. Hello, everyone. Ralph Peterson here, just filling out some holiday cards. If you're, it's that time of the year, aren't you filling out holiday cards? <laughs> I am so happy to be here talking to you today because I'm starting a brand new series every Monday morning here on LinkedIn and on YouTube, and we are live on Twitch as well. So hello, everyone out there in any of those platforms. Every Monday morning, I'm going to be doing this little series called Housekeeping Podcast TV, where I come live and talk about management, leadership, sales, business, housekeeping, cleaning, business, to be sure. And one of the things I really want to talk about, first and foremost, is about the idea of management and about the idea of leadership. And more specifically, who exactly is in management? Who is in a position of leadership? I attended, I remember this was years and years ago, but I attended a sales workshop and I wasn't in sales at the time. It was just a workshop with multiple speakers throughout the day. And one of the speakers was a sales speaker. And I remember him coming up on stage and him asking by a show of hands, how many people in the room are in sales? And there were a few notable people who would raise their hand. And it, and it turns out that they raised their hand because they had a job description, a, a, a business card, heck, even an ID that identified them in sales. They were a sales associate or a sales director or a sales manager. And everybody, all these people who raised their hand, they absolutely knew without a doubt. that. They and then the speaker was like, well, the joke's on you or however it was he said it pretty cleverly that you're all in sales. Everybody in this room, everybody in business, it doesn't matter if you're a receptionist, the CEO, an actual person who has the sales title, you're a technician, you're a, a housekeeper. It doesn't matter what position you are in, in the facility or in the company, your job is in sales. And not only are you selling your products and your services and your company, you're also more importantly selling yourself. And it was very, you know, again, it was years and years ago that I heard that whole scenario. And I thought it was pretty resonating with me. I thought it was pretty clever the way that the speaker said it. And sure enough, I agreed. Okay. Even though I'm not technically in sales, maybe he's right. Maybe I actually am in a position of sales. I am always selling myself at the very least. And I can see how whatever it is I say, do or think, affects the companies and affects the company that I work for, their sales. And so, okay, so I bought into the whole thing. But here's the thing lately, as I've been going around and touring with my new book, The Good Manager, and talking all about the sales, I mean, the, the management process and what a leadership system is and the five rules of management and on and on, the golden rules of management, I started to understand or at least talk about more openly i guess understand is the real word too because i hadn't quite understood it the way i'm going to explain it to you now the question of who is actually in management who is actually in leadership the answer is well everybody if there's not a per i don't know a single person who is not in a position of influence i don't know a single person i don't even know children who are not in a position of influence they all are Actually, children are pretty great at managing and leading at times. Everyone is in a position of leadership. Everyone has responsibility, which is, by the way, the definition of management, somebody in a position of responsibility, somebody who either willingly or unwillingly is put in charge of something or someone or some process or some product or some service out there. And so it is with that idea that I'm coming to you and talking to you about management and about leadership and about sales and about business every Monday here on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitch is this idea of management, of the idea that you are in charge, that I am in charge, whether we like it or not, we are in charge, maybe not at work, maybe not in a position of authority at work, but we are certainly in charge of our lives, of our daily work, of our families. We are in, in our neighborhoods. We all have a position of leadership, position of responsibility, and a position of management. And one thing that I learned very early on in my management career, because I've always wanted to be in charge. I've always wanted to be the manager, be the leader, be the person who is responsible, be the top 
person in an organization or on a team. I just have always, it probably plays right into my ego, but it also plays into my incessant need to support and help and develop. And I just absolutely love it when other people get a win. If I'm able to assist somebody to get a win, if I just see somebody getting a win, you know, the, the, the good person overcoming the bad person, the, the good person standing up for the, or the, the strong person standing up for the weak person. It just, man, it is everything to me. So what I learned early on as a manager, as a young manager, when I first started getting into the role of leadership and learning all about making decisions and prioritizing and having to communicate and problem solve and, and change and ebb and flow and go and try to keep your eye on the the mission of the organization or the thing that you're trying to accomplish, and you're still trying to get it done as quickly and as efficiently as possible. What I've learned through that process, I've been doing it for a long time now, is every time I got better at managing at work, I would get better at managing my own life. That's really true. The better I got at, and, and, and the opposite is true too. I mean, the worse I got at work, the, the more disregarding I got of people, uh, of situations, of timing, of the, the more I let go of that stuff, the more that I didn't care, the it affected my life as well. I don't, I don't know who it was or, I mean, because I hear it so often, it's probably has to do with who I listen to and the type of things I listen to, but somebody, I don't know if it was Jim Rohn or Zig Ziglar or... <laughs> I mean, it, it could be anybody, really. Uh, uh, Tony Robbins. Uh, I've listened to so many people. Grant Cardone is, is a Gary V. Uh, you know, I, I go on and on about who may have said it, but the idea that whatever actually, it might have even been. Oh gosh, I'm listening to a book right now. Let me. You just hold on. I'm going to find it because it's important to give the credit where the credit is due. Uh, Bob Proctor. I think it's actually Bob Proctor. I'm listening to Bob Proctor and his book is It's Not About the Money is a, a book that I'm reading right now by Bob Proctor. It may actually have been Bob Proctor who, who had said it, but he said, whatever you have right now in your life has been literally brought on to you through you. You brought it up uh, everywhere I am today in my life. I manifested. I more than manifested. I reached out and grabbed. And sometimes even when it was a crap sandwich, you know, like you ever heard that that statement? If you find yourself eating a crap sandwich, you probably ordered it along the way. Well, I'll tell you something. I know that I have ordered a ton of crap sandwiches in my day. So, with that being said, I know that the better I got at my job, the better I got. The more I learned about management, about responsibility, about leadership, about communication, about follow up, about decision making, about all of those things, the better I got at my own personal life. So professional growing professionally has always helped me grow personally and vice versa. Growing personally has always helped me grow professionally. And so with that in mind, I want to talk about a simple, simple concept today, and that is. Here's the question. How do you know? How do you know? It's a question worth writing down and posting. I have it on my monitor on a little a stick and note right this second. How do you know? And I keep that question in mind always because it, it is the quintessential question to figuring out if you are doing a good job, if you are on the right track, if you are managing effectively, if you are doing what it is you are set out to do. How do you know? Here's to make it even more poignant, how do you know? A lot of you, and I know I'm in the same boat. I would tell you emphatically without a question that I'm a great manager. Forget a good manager. I would say I'm a great manager. Here's the question, though. How do you know? Let's say that I agreed that I, or I agreed. <laughs> if I, let's say I agreed with myself. Of course, I agree with myself. Let's say that I said I'm a good manager. The question anybody should be asking me, and indeed the question I should be asking myself is, how do I know? How do I know I'm a good manager? Who has the who is the best person to tell me whether or not I'm a good manager? 
And how do I even hear from that pe- that person or, or that person or those people? How do I hear from them? And so when it comes to management at work, when it comes to management at work, the answer is, how do I, it, well, let me break it down to a couple of questions. First, I'm saying I'm a good manager. I'm going to make that declarative statement. I am a really good manager. That's my declarative statement. The next question is, how do I know would first rest on who can be the decider? Who decides whether or not I'm a good manager? It is not, by the way, me, as much as I would love it to be me. Wouldn't it be great if I'm the one who got to decide if I'm a good manager or not? I, my perception doesn't, it's not me. Who else can tell me? Can it be my staff? Staff do a pretty good job giving you some indicators, but no, not your staff either. I know who's drinking coffee while making a video. Me. Staff can't tell you either. Not honestly, anyway. The best arbiter or the best people who can tell you, give you a real good sense of whether or not you are on the right track, you're doing a good job managing or not, is your customers or your end users, the people who get your service and and rely on your service or the people who get your products and use your products and rely on your products. Those are the people. That's why reviews are so important and so valuable. Customer reviews are super, super valuable because your customers are the only ones who can tell you whether or not you're doing a good job as a manager, as a leader. Then the next question is then, how do you find out if you're doing a good job as a manager, as a leader? And you can wait for the review. You can be the type of person who just simply goes to Yelp or Amazon or whatever it is, wherever it is that you're getting your, your reviews or your notices back. You can wait for them to tell you or you can take a more proactive approach. And that is, of course, what I would suggest that you do. And of course, I'm only talking about business right now, but you can see the correlation between your business life, your professional life, and your personal life when it comes to soliciting feedback. So let's just talk professionally. How do I know my customer is happy? Let me even scratch that for a second and say, how do I know I work at housekeeping. As you all know, I am the housekeeper. Nobody wears a shirt like this without having that title. (laughs) How do I know my staff clean the rooms or the areas or the bathrooms that they're supposed to be cleaning? How how can I know? Well, there's a couple of ways. I can go look myself to make sure, or I can trust that they're going to do what I told them. I could have communicated it and like, hey, this is what I need you to do and just trust that they did it. I can, of course, rely on a third party. I can rely on the actual employee who I can say, hey, did you get that done? And they say yes or no, and then just take their word for it. I can take a third party where, where it's not my employee, it's not me who sees it, but then it's somebody else who sees it. And they tell me whether or not the room was cleaned or not clean. And of those three ways, four ways, you could imagine the most effective way is probably me going in and seeing it myself, which is perfect if I don't have a lot of employees or a lot of rooms to check. But if there are a lot of employees or there are a lot of rooms, it becomes quite impossible, quite, if not impossible, really, really difficult for me to inspect every nook and cranny that my employees are supposed to be cleaning on an everyday basis. It can be quite overwhelming. So how do I inspect those areas without inspecting those areas? Or how do I ensure those areas are being clean without being able to actually see them being clean? And the answer is, of course, I keep saying the word, of course, the turn of phrase, of course. I don't know why, because... I don't like it. I'm going to stop saying it. (laughs) Self-editing here. The the way to do it is by auditing. And so you take a sample size. You're doing a small amount of inquiry and you're, you're extrapolating that to show a larger thing. And really all I'm looking for is trends when I do that. I remember I worked for a company that we had to do payroll audits. 
And a payroll audit is such a huge pain in the neck because what you have to do is you have to go, and this is this is years and years ago, where we actually had paper time cards. You had to go to a clock and ding, ding, you know. And we would have to check each and every one of the time clocks. We, would we wouldn't we would have to check each and every one. We would take a sample of three. We would just randomly grab three time clocks, and then we would match up the time they were supposed to start with their schedule, and then we would look for the seven-minute rule. We would look to make sure they punched in on time, they punched out on time, they took their breaks on time, and at the end of the day, the, the hours that they were supposed to get paid for, the hours that they actually worked, were denoted correctly and then we would actually match those hours up to the payroll record to make sure that not only did we calculate them properly on the payroll report but then they actually got paid those hours what we would do is you pull three of these time cards and the rule was if all three of them come back as good to go no issues you were done you didn't have to do anymore but if you found an error, you had to pull one more time card. So if you found one area you had to pull on one card, you had to replace that time card and pull an additional time card. But if you found another error on any of those time cards, then you had to audit all of the time cards. Now, imagine if you had 30 employees and you had to audit all of them. I mean, pack of lunch friends because you're going to be there for a long time auditing 30 time cards and then if there's more than i think three or four or five mistakes if you have three or four employees five employees that have mistakes on their pay or on their time current time card then you have to go back and do the set behind that the, the previous two weeks and if there's any errors on that the previous two weeks of that and you had to keep going backwards until you found no errors because you needed to correct all the errors. You needed to get these people because most of the time when, when the, an error was made, it was made against the employee, you know, like they were, they were supposed to get 15 minutes more and they didn't. It's all based on the seven minute rule, which is a whole other thing. So they punch in it seven minutes of or eight minutes of rather than seven minutes of where they punch out eight minutes after instead of seven minutes after. And that would be the difference between the, the clock stopping at four o'clock and the clock stopping at 415, you know, just that one minute difference. And so it was, you know, it's a common tricky little thing. And thank God for electronic time clocks now because they catch it, assume, presumably. So either, either way, all my point is, is that we would take and do these snapshots. And then if, if we found errors, we would have to start pulling that error thread, pulling it apart to find and fix the whole issue and so my challenge to you is to start doing these types of audits with your customers reach out to customers make it super simple for them to figure out don't just say we do a really great job how do you know you're doing a great job how do you know that's a super super important question in business you want to know if your customers are happy don't wait for them to come to you with a cancellation notice that's happened to me way too many times I can't tell you, I've been blindsided where I thought they were happy. And why did I think my customer is happy? Because they weren't complaining to me. It wasn't, it turns out they were complaining. They just weren't complaining to me. And your customers, or if your customers are anything like my customers, they don't want to complain to me. They think that I should already know the problems are going on. If you were any good at your job, if you were any good of a manager, you're only ever good as a, if you were as good of a manager as you thought, as you say you are. You would have already known I had a problem. I wasn't happy. You, All the indicators were there. And of course, all the indicators weren't clear to me, but they were clear to them. And now the question is, could they have been clear to me? And the answer is yes. You mean, yeah, I should have, could have done a better job reaching out and being very clear in asking how well we're doing being very clear about auditing and about trying to find problems before they manifested into a cancellation, manifested into a termination. Oh, you bet. Getting fired as a manager and then sitting there and not knowing why? I don't know. It's happened to me a bunch of times. A bunch of times where I'm sitting there 
just shaking my head going, I don't understand. I, I didn't see this coming. I don't know why this is happening to me. Why am I getting terminated? Why am I, why am I getting demoted? Why am I, what didn't I do? And the answer is what I didn't do is I didn't see. I was too busy or not thinking about, or didn't see the value in making sure my customer is happy, making sure the follow-up is happening. Follow-up, by the way, is anybody can make a decision. Hell, anybody can communicate a decision. But boy, it takes some cojones. It takes some intestinal fortitude to follow up. To, uh -huh. Is it done? Is it not done? Because the fear of it, the fear of following up is you're going to find out it wasn't done. The fear of following up is you're going to find out that your customer's not happy. The fear of following up, boy, bay, it could be challenging to follow up. It's like playing Russian roulette and you pull that trigger and you have no idea. Is it just going to be a loud noise or are you actually going to get smacked in the face? Mm. How do you know? Very important. That's it. If you like the content today, if you like the Housekeepers podcast, if you want to hear more of this, please, if you're on LinkedIn, please follow me. If you're on YouTube or Twitch, please subscribe. Please let me know if you have any questions, anything you want me to answer about leadership, about management, about running, about books, about podcasts. I'll talk about anything. That's it. Housekeepers podcast. I'll see you later.